Good to be with you this morning. Uh, we are wrapping up our Gospel Truth series today, uh, and we are going to be in John chapter 18. But before we read there, I want to share with you just a little snippet of one of the very earliest statements of faith that, that the church came up with. It's called the Apostles' Creed. Because the central character, central bad guy, in our story today is featured in this little snippet. Now, listen to this confession of faith from the early church. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, was buried. Pontius Pilate. It's interesting to me, it's always been interesting to me that he's the guy that gets mentioned in this early statement of faith. Why Pontius Pilate? There's a whole host of bad guys to choose from, right, in the gospel story. You've got Herod, and you've got Judas, you've got Caiaphas, the high priest, and all the other religious leaders that support him. There are plenty of bad guys to choose from, but the one that gets singled out for us to remember is Pontius Pilate. And what I want to do this morning is sit with why it might be him. Why Pontius Pilate is the one that we are asked to remember as we confess our faith, as we remember the gospel story. The early church wanted us to remember the name Pontius Pilate. Well, let's read in John chapter 18, starting in verse 28. Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, they did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, what charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you, which that statement sounds a lot like what my kids say when they're tattletailing, right? Would I have told you he stole my Legos if he had not? Yes, you would have said that. <laughs> Pilate said, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, they objected. They took this took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea? Jesus asked, Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth, retorted Pilate. With this, he went out again to the Jews gathered there and said, I find no basis of a charge against him. But it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? And they shouted back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. Let's pray together. Father, as we hear again the story of our Lord's betrayal and arrest, and the judgment made against him at his mock trial, I pray that our own spirits 
would be convicted by the waywardness of those who did evil in this story. That we might recognize that the same evil that guided those who betrayed and murdered Jesus might also reside within us. And yet we declare before you this morning we do not want to go that way. We want to be faithful. We want to live in accordance with your kingdom. We want to live the way that Christ lived. Even if it means dying the kind of death he died. And we do this in faith, entrusting ourselves to you, the eternal one, in whom is the power of resurrection for all things. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, Pilate is caught in the middle. He is caught between the Jewish leaders who are outside and Jesus, this innocent man who is inside the palace. And he's caught between these two because the Jewish leaders don't want to enter the palace. Because it is, it is the palace of a Gentile. And they would prefer to be ritually pure as they condemn an innocent man to death. And the irony of that. So Pilate goes back and forth, inside and outside, again and again, as he tries to sort out the situation. Because it's a confusing situation. It makes no sense if you're sitting where Pilate is sitting. Because what these Jewish leaders have done, what they say they're doing, is turning in their own king to their mortal enemies, to their political enemies. It's all part of this political game that the Jewish leaders are playing. Because they want Jesus crucified on a Roman cross. That's the only way that their problem goes away. Because they do have the option of killing him themselves. We've seen this throughout the Gospels. There's these moments where Jesus is about to be pushed off a cliff or they pick up stones to stone him, but it never happens. They could have. They could have decided, all right, we've got to get rid of this guy. They get rid of him themselves. The problem with that, though, is Jesus is popular. And if the Jewish leaders kill him themselves, then all of a sudden, they've lost their following. There would be a vote of no confidence against them. No one would follow them anymore because they just murdered the prophet of God, the Messiah, as many believe Jesus to be. But if they could have him crucified on a Roman cross, if they could get Rome to do their dirty work, well, then their problems go away. Because what is the Messiah supposed to do? He's supposed to lead an uprising against Rome. He's supposed to conquer the enemy of the people of Israel. And so if Rome kills Jesus, well, then clearly he wasn't the Messiah in the first place. And the faith that the people had put in him was misplaced. For the Jewish leaders to maintain power, for them to keep their standing, they need Rome to kill Jesus for him, for them. And so they go to Pilate and they ask him to kill their own king. And what they have to do is convince Rome that this would actually be good for Rome. It is in Rome's best interest to murder Jesus, to execute Jesus. They have to convince Pilate 
that Jesus really is this revolutionary set on upending the Roman Empire, at least in Judea. That's how they have to get Pilate to see Jesus. They have to convince Pilate that Jesus is a threat to Roman sovereignty over their their area in Judea. And so in this weird turn of events, the Jewish leaders start acting like they're allies to Rome. That all of a sudden we want to be friends. I mean, the situation is almost like if the Avengers took the Infinity Stones and handed them to Thanos, right? right, Hey, I know you've been trying to collect these. Uh, We're sorry we've been getting in the way, but here you go, do your thing. Or it would be like the University of Alabama trying to convince Auburn to hire Nick Saban. Would you take him, please? I mean, it makes, it makes no sense. Handing over your key guy, your leader, to your mortal enemy. And I think that's why Pilate sees through it. He knows you guys are not on my side. Something else is going on here, and so I've got to get to the bottom of it. And so he goes back inside and he talks to Jesus. And it becomes very clear to Pilate that Jesus is not who the Jewish leaders say Jesus is. That this man is not a threat to Roman sovereignty. And he figures that out because, number one, Jesus doesn't have an army. And number two, Jesus cares about the truth. And both of those things make you a bad politician. Right? If, if you don't have an army to amass power, and if you're not willing to lie to get ahead, you're not going to make it very far in the world of politics. That's the world Pilate lives in. That's the world that has caused him to become jaded and cynical. So that when he hears someone who is genuinely interested in the truth, he scoffs at them. Well, what is truth? That's not how the world works. No one cares about truth. All there is is propaganda and spin. It's just a dog-eat-dog world. And unless you're willing to compromise your principles then you're not going to get very far. There's no way you're going to end up at the top of the heap. And so Pilate sees this about Jesus. No, this is not a political threat. He has no one fighting for him. He doesn't seem interested in power, not willing to lie to keep it or gain it. This man is no threat to Rome. And I imagine Pilate probably sees Jesus as an ideologue. This man who is committed to his ideals, to his principles. To Pilate, he probably seems naive. Too idealistic to make it in the real world. And so it's easy for Pilate to say, yeah, okay, I'm going to be just fine. Rome is going to be just fine if this guy is leading the uprising. And I think it's important for us to note here that the jadedness that we see in Pilate, this reaction to truth, as if it's not even really a thing, that truth doesn't really matter, it corresponds to our own time, right? I've I've heard people describe our own time as post-truth. And here's what's striking to me as I read John 18. It was post-truth in the first century, too. We like to think that this is like the first time this has ever happened. Chronological snobbery is what some people call it. We think our time is the most important time, that everything that happens now is unprecedented. The truth is these things have been happening for centuries and centuries and millennia and millennia before I like the way Thomas Merton talks about our relationship with the truth as human beings. He says in his book, Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander, 
which I love that title, by the way. We are all convinced that we desire the truth above all. But actually, what we desire is not the truth so much as to be right, to be in the right. What we seek is not the pure truth, but the partial truth that justifies our prejudices, our limitations, our selfishness. This is not the truth. It's only an argument strong enough to prove us right. That's the human relationship with truth, I think by default almost. That what we want is just to be in the right. In the right. The truth is too heavy a thing for us to truly pursue it. It would require too much of us, and so we settle for partial truths that, that support the way we've already decided to live. And it's always been that way. That's a feature of human existence. Thomas Merton wrote that in 1966. It was true then. It's true now. And it was true in the first century, too. That most people are just not that interested in actually pursuing the truth. They just want a piece of it. Just enough to justify the way we live our lives. And so it's important for us to keep in mind being post-truth didn't start with the internet or with Facebook or with cable news. All those things simply amplify the sickness that is already in the hearts of human beings. And that the one who is truth, he's the only one that can solve that. Is the only remedy for living in a post-truth world that has always been post-truth. So we return to Pilate, who is calloused by his years in politics, who no longer believes that truth is a meaningful category, which also means he pretty much assumes everyone's lying. He's always reading between the lines because what people say is probably not what they actually mean. There's always something behind it. And so he's able to call the Jewish leaders bluff. Do you want me to release to you your king? Now, the rational answer to that question would be yes. Yes, we want our king returned back to us. It's Passover. It's one of the traditions for Pilate to release a prisoner. He's saying, look, I appreciate you guys trying to help us out here, but I want to honor you and honor your traditions. And so would it be meaningful as a political goodwill gesture for me to return to you your king? And instead, the Jewish leaders ask for somebody else. They ask for Barabbas who is a leader in a rebellion against Rome. That is, they want Pilate to release someone who is actually guilty of the thing that they're accusing Jesus of. Again, the irony is just dripping through this entire story. No, 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 no. Keep our king. Give us Barabbas. It makes no sense if you look at it at face value. And so Pilate is... He's confirmed his theory. Okay, they're, they're not interested. This guy is not really their king. Something else is going on here. And so he starts trolling them. He starts dressing Jesus up. In the next chapter, in chapter 19, as this story continues, we find Jesus in that crown of thorns draped in a purple robe. And in some translations, it says that Pilate took Jesus and seated him on the judgment seat. It's a little unclear. Sometimes it sounds like Pilate is sitting in the judgment seat, but I think it might be likely that it's actually Jesus, as it is in some translations, that it's Jesus sitting in the judgment seat. And he's saying, all right, here's your king. Mocking them to their face. This guy isn't really your king, and I know it but I'm going to keep rubbing it in your face and calling your bluff. This guy, sitting in a crown of thorns, looks 
completely unfit. Anyone can see through it. This guy doesn't belong in the judgment seat. He starts trolling them. And as he calls their bluff, he decides that what he really wants is he sees the corruption that the Jewish leaders have within them. This this awful thing that they're trying to perpetrate against an innocent man, he decides to try to get Jesus off. Pilate sees the truth, at least part of it, enough of it, to know that what's happening to Jesus is not okay. And so twice in 18 and 19, Pilate says, Look, I find no basis for any charges against this man. And then we are literally told, John tells us from that point on, he tried to get Jesus off. He tried to let Jesus go. He tried everything in his power to gain Jesus' freedom because he saw that this was wrong. He saw enough of the truth to know that this was injustice. And that he didn't really want to have any part of it. And so the, the Jewish leaders turn the screws on him and they start to insinuate that they could make things very uncomfortable for him if he didn't do what they want. They know that he is obligated to honor their traditions. And so they say, you know, we have laws of our own. And according to those laws, this guy is guilty and you have to. You have to execute him. It says Pilate got really scared after they said that. Why? Because he knows if that word gets up the food chain that there is this mass uprising in Judea and it's because of him, well, his bosses are not going to be very happy. The Jewish leaders say, we can make things really uncomfortable for you. We need you to take this guy down. And in a moment where they completely tell on themselves, they say, we have no king but Caesar. During Passover, where they remember God, their true king, who rescued them out of bondage in Egypt, who overcame the king Pharaoh and became the king of the people of God by rescuing them and drawing them to himself. They reject their own God and say, Oh, Caesar. Caesar's our guy. And at that point, there are no more moves left for Pilate. And our story ends like this. The story of Pilate ends like this. Verse 16, finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. That is Pilate's part in the gospel. That story that you've heard today. And I think the reason we are asked to remember it, that the early Christians thought it was so important to remember Pontius Pilate, is because it is clear that he saw enough of the truth to know that Jesus didn't deserve what he was getting. And he ignored that truth. out of an effort to save his own skin, in an effort to maintain political power, in an effort to cool things down with very angry people, he caved. He saw the truth and ignored it. And how often are we in the same place? The church said, I think, we need to remember Pontius Pilate because maybe we are most likely to be like him as Christians. To know the truth, to hear the truth, to witness the truth, to gather on Sunday mornings and sing the truth over one another, to gather for communion and eat and drink the truth and then ignore it. Because there is such a difference between knowing the truth 
seeing the truth and actually living as if it's true. Uh, a few months ago during Halloween, I took Kristen on a very hot date to a haunted house. And us and all the teenagers that were there had a great time. Uh, we, we navigated through this thing, and I knew in my mind that that chainsaw did not have a chain on it. I knew that. I knew that the person in the mask was not actually a zombie. I knew that the smoke and the fog were made by smoke machines. I knew that the blood on the table was fake blood. I knew all those things, and I still screamed my lungs out. <laughs> there is a huge difference between knowing the truth and behaving as if it's true. That so often there is this gap in our own lives between what we confess to be true and what our own lives share about us. In the life of discipleship, the life we have partaken in at our baptisms is this long journey towards closing that gap. That inch by inch, we become the kind of people who believe what we say we believe. So I've, I've been convicted by my favorite movie right now, uh, it's a movie called A Hidden Life, and I recommend everyone watch it. Uh, it's one of those that you probably watch once because it's so intense, it's kind of like the Passion of the Christ kind of thing, but it is worth one watch. It's a, about a man named Franz Jägerstatter, who's an Austrian man living during the rise of Nazi Germany, and Germany annexed Austria, which means the citizens of Austria are now citizens of Nazi Germany. And they start conscripting the, the able-bodied men in Austria to serve in the Nazi army. And there comes a day where Franz gets his letter in the mail that says he's being called up. And one of the things they have to do in order to serve in the army, as they're forced to serve, is pledge loyalty to Hitler. And so the moment he gets this letter, his life is turned upside down, and he feels the turmoil. What do you do in that moment? Do you swear loyalty to Hitler with your fingers crossed behind your back? Do you go along with it and try to make the best of it? Maybe try to find a way to serve in the army that doesn't involve you killing anyone, serve as a medic? Or do you choose to, to not do it, to not swear loyalty and whatever, whatever comes your way, come what may? And as he's wrestling with it, a, a good chunk of the movie is just watching him wrestle with that decision, which is part of why I love it, because it's such a good depiction of what it's like to live our lives as Christians. This moment, these constant moments of decision, will I follow Christ or not? Will I live as if this is really true or not? But one of the pivotal moments as he's making his decision is this conversation he has with a church painter. This guy who comes in and he paints all the saints and pictures from the Bible on the church walls. And I want to share with you this conversation that they have. This is what the painter says to Franz. I paint the tombs of the prophets. I help people look up from those pews and dream. They look up and they imagine if they lived back in Christ's time that they would not have done what the others did, that they wouldn't become Pontius Pilate, that they would have murdered those which they now adore. I paint all this suffering, but I do not suffer myself. I make a living of it. What we do is just create sympathy. We create admirers. We don't create followers. But Christ's life is a demand. You don't want to be reminded of it, so we don't have to see what happens to the truth. 
A darker time is coming when men will be more clever. They won't fight the truth, they'll just ignore it. I paint their comfortable Christ with a halo over his head. How can I show what I have not lived? Someday I'll have the, vin- the courage to venture. Not yet. Someday I'll paint a true Christ. That's the task in front of us, church. It's to, with our lives, paint a true Christ. To live as if the truth is actually true. And so we take baby steps, small steps that venture into that truth, small brush strokes every day as we attempt to live the kind of life that Christ is actually living in us already. So I want to end with this, the rest of the Apostles' Creed, that section about Jesus. This is what the church confesses about Christ. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. This is what the church believes. And may we be the kind of people who live as if that is true. Let's pray together. Father, we confess our weakness to you. That faced with decisions about whether we will follow your way, whether we will take our stand on the firm ground, whether we will trust you with our lives, that so often we turn away. We confess that we have seen the truth, that there have been times that we have ignored it. But Father, we know that with you there is forgiveness. that you are a God full of mercy. And that even as Jesus spoke over those enemies at the cross who crucified him unjustly, asking for you to forgive them, that those same words wash over us now as well. And may we receive that forgiveness that we might live lives to your glory. May we receive your mercy so that we might be made new. Would you give us the strength today, this week, to take one step, make one small brushstroke, towards painting a true Christ with our own lives. Grant us this through the power of your Holy Spirit. And in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.